Okay, um, since this is a two country program, uh, it's a uh, good afternoon for uh, Portugal and uh, good evening for Turkey. Um, this is the sixth video discussion of Cappadocia University's project, um, A Common Horizon for Humanity and the Planet. Okay. And this evening, we'll be exploring uh, the hor this horizon, the common horizon, with Professor Katerina Bello uh, from American University in Cairo. Welcome, Professor Bello. Thank you. So far, mm -hmm, so far uh, we have had uh, Professor Usama Makdisi, Professor Adam Getachu, Professor Joseph Massad, Professor Frank Furedi, and Professor Susan Buck-Morse. Uh, hosted in this series. Videos of these past programs are already on YouTube on the Cappadocia University page with subtitles in Turkish and English and other languages are pending. Okay. Now, our university, Cappadocia University, is young as universities go, but is already somewhat known in academic circles. However, we are known by a much wider audience for our location. It's Cappadocia, Urgup, in the heart of Turkey, uh, where we have underground cities, fairy chimneys, and skies full of colorful balloons and trickster pigeons. <laughs> and the location, and this is the location of the oldest uh, Christian churches as well. Now, our project, A Common Horizon for Humanity and the Planet, um, is introduced on the university website as, and I quote, as history continues its march, we are reminded that the answer to the common problems of humanity cannot be found by becoming more introverted, polarized, or prejudiced. No matter how severe our problems, our destiny should not be seen as unchangeable. The problems we, we experience are primarily a result of human activity and can be overcome, overcome only through human effort. But we should remain aware that there are many different hurdles to be passed if we are to rid ourselves of the crises being experienced in many parts of the world. Only through conscious, patient and collective effort can we overcome the problems of humanity? Now, um, Katerina Bello, an associate professor of philosophy at the American University in Cairo, uh, completed her BA in philosophy at the University of Lisbon in 1997 and continued with Arabic and Islamic studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in 2000, in the year 2000. She received her PhD in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford in 2004. Uh, she specializes in medieval Islamic philosophy, particularly on Avicenna's and Averroes's physics and metaphysics. Well, in, in its original language, uh, and in our language, in Turkish, it's Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd. Other interests include medieval Islamic theology, Kelam, and medieval Christian philosophy with a focus on the thought of St. Thomas of Aquinas. Uh, she has also conducted research on German idealism, in particular Hegel's philosophy. In addition, she has studied the interaction of philosophy and religion in the Middle Ages and in Hegel's works. She is the author of Chance and Determinism in Avicenna and Averroes, 2007, O Essential sobre Averroes, I, I hope I pronounced this correctly, this is in Portuguese, 2007, Averroes and Hegel on Philosophy and Religion, 2013, and Spirit in Philosophy, a Metaphysical Inquiry. Her book, Chance and Determinism in Avicenna and Averroes was translated to Turkish uh, with the title Ibn Sina ve Ibn Rushd, 
belirlen, belirlenimcilik ve rastlantı. Um, and today she will talk on free will and determinism in classical Islamic philosophy. Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and Ibn Rushd. So I present you, Professor Bello. Uh, thank you, Professor mm -hmm. Oxus. And uh, I'm very grateful to the uh, at Cappadocia University for this uh, kind invitation. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, I'm uh, also very glad that um, this book was uh, translated into, into Turkish. And I've met the translator in some years ago in Istanbul. That was uh, very nice as well. And um, uh, in under Kan Muti, and um, and so now I'll 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 talk about some talk topics fr from the book, and I'll add um, um, Al Farabi, and um, uh, and so regarding this issue and how can we relate to um, contemporary issues. Um, the question of free will and, and determinism is, is uh, one of the perennial issues in, in philosophy. Um, and it's, it has different dimensions, but it's, um, uh, the question is, do we have the freedom to act, to decide? Um, uh, are there external factors determining the way in which we act? And uh, those external factors could be nature. We, are we determined by our genes or um, any surrounding uh, factors? Maybe we are determined by, by God to act in a certain way. And so these questions are still with us. Different philosophers um, have different uh, solutions. So this is an issue that has been debated for thousands of years. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm going to focus on um, classical Islamic philosophy, and uh, and obviously um, the issue is um, uh, freedom is is a good thing, but the issue is if, if we're not free to act, um, uh, then th there are um, uh, consequences for ethics. If we're not free, um, can we be made responsible for what we do? Um, and uh, in the, there are questions, obviously, of punishment or reward. Um, and uh, one, one of the um, modern philosophers who deals with this uh, issue in a very um, um, clear way is, is uh, Kant in the critique of uh, pure reason. Um, um, and with regard to the, uh, it's the third antinomy of pure reason. And um, he says that this question hasn't been uh, solved. And, um, and he says, so, some, some people would defend the view that uh, we are determined in, in what we do. Um, uh, and, and others would say that we are free. Um, and, and freedom in this case means autonomy. So to be able to decide ourselves without having external um, factors. Uh, and so freedom means that the action, the decisions and the actions uh, come from ourselves. And, and so these are the two um, uh, sides of, of this uh, antinomy. And this is still very important, obviously, because when we're discussing ethics and human action, uh, it's important to know whether we are free or not. And, and different philosophers have taken different views. And uh, for instance, in the modern period, Spinoza is known to have been um, a determinist um, philosopher. So, uh, and, and so different views have been taken. And in Islamic philosophy also, in classical or medieval Islamic philosophy has a rich tradition um, uh, on this issue. And, um, uh, and different views have been uh, proposed. Um, and uh, naturally Islamic philosophy could say Arabic philosophy, Islamic philosophy. Um, it was obviously influenced by, by Islam and uh, the general issue is um, uh, that uh, obviously we are responsible uh, for what we do. Not everything, but there are certain actions which um, uh, we are responsible for. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, on, on the one hand, this is an important issue that we have to be free or we have to somehow be responsible for our actions so that uh, we're accountable. 
we made accountable. And uh, but at the same time, and obviously this is within the Islamic tradition in in the Quran, the sacred book of Islam, uh, God is um, all powerful. And so how do we reconcile these things? Uh, does all power belong to God? Do we have some power to act and, and to decide? Um, and in the Quran has uh, presents both uh, these ideas that we have um, uh, we are responsible for what we do. Uh, and we, we have the ability to choose uh, on the one hand uh, and also, uh, but, but also the idea that God is all powerful. Um, and we find this also in, in Hadith literature and um, in, in one of the classical topics is uh, Qadar, so uh, predestination. Um, and, uh, and there's another issue if we just look at it from uh, the point of view of God's attributes uh, God determines um, everything that happens, um, but uh, because He's all powerful. At the same time, God is just, so it wouldn't make sense um, uh, for God to punish us if we're not responsible. If if the actions somehow don't come from us, um, and uh, uh, and so there's a need. Philosophers and medieval theologians have. Uh, try to to solve to, to harmonize these two uh, divine attributes. So God should reward according to merit, and that's the, um, uh, the idea that we find in 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 religious literature in in the Quran. Um, and so we have to have some kind of freedom or responsibility um, in order to be held accountable for our actions. Um, and so this is an important influence, obviously, um, uh, in Al-Farabi, in, uh, in Sina, and in Ibn Rush, there's this religious aspect. Um, and, um, and there's also, on the, so this, uh, um, um, the intersection between uh, human action and divine uh, omnipotence. Uh, but at the same time, they were influenced by Greek philosophy and uh, primarily Aristotle and also Neoplatonism. And in, in, in this case, we have a question of um, causality. So this idea that uh, nothing happens from Aristotle, but even from before Aristotle, Parmenides, um, uh, pre-Socratic philosophy, that nothing happens without a cause. Um, uh, and also the idea that uh, um, responsibility uh, presupposes freedom. And so on the one hand, there's uh, the issue of, of um, natural philosophy, but we find causality at different levels, but also in, in natural uh, philosophy, what happens in nature. And, um, uh, and also there's the question of, do things happen in a necessary way or uh, perhaps they can be changed? Uh, can they be changed in, in the present or the future? Um, and so these are some of, some of the issues um, that um, are central to this debate regarding uh, free will and, um, and determinism. Um, and um, Al-Farabi is a very important um, uh, philosopher. He wrote on philosophy, music, and science. He has a, a vast corpus, and uh, not all of it has survived, but... Uh, Many important works have survived, and uh, he was the first one in the um, uh, Islamic tradition to develop a complete philosophical system, and that's why he's so important. Um, and he wrote introductions to uh, philosophy, uh, commentaries on Plato's and Aristotle's works, and also um, systematic works of uh, philosophy. And so. Um, uh, one of the passages in which he uh, uh, grapples with this issue of free will and um, um, determinism is uh, um, in uh, uh, his commentary on Aristotle's On Interpretation. This is a famous work by, a logical work by Aristotle. And Aristotle asks the question uh, regarding future statements. So when we're talking about the future, uh, do these uh, 
propositions have a definite truth value. And the example he gives is of a future uh, sea battle. And he says, if we say now there will be a sea battle tomorrow, is this definitely true or false? Uh, and if we say that it's definitely true or false, it means um, that the future is determined. So we go from a, a logical level, so a purely linguistic level, to, to a metaphysical or ontological. So we're talking about language, but it has an impact on reality and, and what we say about reality. And so um, um, in, 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 in commenting on, on this passage, Al-Farabi has to deal with the question of free will and uh, determinism. Um, and uh, uh, Aristotle says, um, uh, we can say that present events might be necessary, but when we talk about the future, it's not as clear. Um, uh, if we say, then I'll also mention the question of possibility and, and necessity. Obviously, something that's possible is something that can be otherwise, can be can exist in different ways. Um, and uh, according to Al-Farabi, uh, um, there are possible events now and, and in the future, which means that they may happen or they may not happen. And, and, and he says there's an indefinite truth value regarding these uh, statements about future events. Um, and he talks about the nature of the possible. Um, and so Al-Farabi is comfortable saying that there's possibility regarding the future. However, there is one problem because he says that because God is all-knowing, uh, he's omniscient, he knows everything, uh, he knows the future. If, he did, if God didn't know the future, he wouldn't be um, all-knowing, so which is not possible. So uh, God knows what will happen. Does that mean that future events are determined? In, in that case, we wouldn't really have uh, freedom of action or free will because um, uh, everything that will happen in the future is already determined now. Um, uh, and he tries to reconcile these views. So God is all powerful, but at the same time, uh, we have free will. Uh, and he gives the example of Zaid. He can go out tomorrow or stay at home. Um, and he says, from the point of view of God, things will happen in a necessary way, but not for Zaid. So the fact that God knows what will happen um, still leaves say the, the option of, of choosing to stay at home or to go out. Um, in, in, in so al Friday makes a certain distinction between logical necessity and metaphysical necessity. So uh, at the level of language and at the level of reality, he makes a distinction between those two. Uh, and so he says, God's foreknowledge does not impose necessity on events. So this is how he comments on Aristotle in, in this issue. And so I would say that Al-Farabi um, thinks of free will as something very important that has to be um, uh, a, a, a position that has to be defended. And, uh, um, and, and so he's different from other positions that will be defended later by uh, Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd. Uh, at the same time, um, he also has systematic works where he describes uh, the universe and uh, how everything comes to be uh, initially from God. And, um, and he has this theory of, of emanation. Uh, uh, and this means that God, which um, Al-Farabi thinks of, a, of as a pure intellect, um, like Aristotle, but he also says that God is the first, um, the first being. Um, and uh, he thinks also, like Aristotle, of a, 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 a big difference between what happens in the celestial world, so above the moon, what happens above the moon, and what happens on Earth, um, and how the celestial spheres influence what, and perhaps determine what happens here. Uh, and he says some things are possible, other things are necessary. So he associates that which is necessary and eternal with the celestial world and that which is possible and can happen in different ways with, with uh, the uh, earthly or terrestrial world. 
Um, and he obviously thinks of the celestial world as being more stable, like, like Aristotle. Um, he says that things in this world are made of form and, and matter. This, this is also from Aristotle. Um, and the celestial bodies ensure this, how, how uh, substances are formed. Um, and uh, the celestial spot, uh, bodies are in a state of, are always active, always moving in a state of perfection. Um, and um, when it comes to, and, and so it's, it's not very clear if what happens in the celestial world determines everything that happens here, but that's possible in principle, although there may still be room um, for free will. Uh, in addition, um, uh, Al Farabi has, uh, uh, as we know, uh, important works on, on, on politics, political theory, and he's inspired by Plato in his uh, ideal of a perfect city um, and a perfect state. And, and obviously, this means when, when we read uh, Al Farabi's works on ethics that we can choose between doing what's right and doing what's wrong. And so, that this is assumption that that um, uh, it's up to us to to choose the right path. Um, and and in th this can happen at in the individual level and also um, at the level of the state. This is uh, very important. And so there's an assumption of uh, uh, the existence of, of free will for uh, human beings. And this is, this is, is very important. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say, al farabi is obviously influenced by the islamic tradition and, and even islamic uh, uh, theology it seems that he was influenced by the mutazilites um, um and he, he defends a kind of causality that is uh, um, uh, inspired by aristotle's works on physics and metaphysics um but also this uh, free will i think has an important uh, role in his uh, philosophy and then I'll move on to Ibn Sina. And uh, um, he was um, influenced by Al Farabi. He uh, adopted his cosmolo cosmological system. So, the way he views what happens in the celestial world and what happens in, the, um, uh, in this world. Um, and uh, he also um, develops this th theory, of, theory of emanation that from God, um, uh, one intellect emanates and then another intellect and then we have in the, the respective spheres of these emanated intellects um, and then um, and so this idea that everything comes to be from God but initially only one effect comes to be uh, directly from God and this is an intellect because God is, is intellect um, and so he adopts in general, um, the uh, worldview of, of Al Farabi, in general, although the details he develops, uh, in particular, some metaphysical notions um, for which Ibn Sina is very famous. Uh, for instance, he says uh, he develops the notion of possible and necessary. And so, in uh, he's inspired by Aristotle, but he has his own reading, um, a very uh, distinctive interpretation of. The notions of possible and necessary, um, and according to Aristotle, in 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 the metaphysics, uh, necessary is what is eternal and what cannot be otherwise. So these are the main uh, two main meanings of necessary. And impossible is something that can change and that can be uh, otherwise. Um, but for even Sina, possible is that which. Uh, D d does not exist and does not have a cause. So uh, maybe a, a unicorn is uh, is is a, a possible being, but we don't see any unicorns in nature. So it, it the unicorn remains in the realm of of possibility. Um, and so um, uh, possible is something that can exist but doesn't yet exist, and it can only exist through a cause, and it's made necessary. Through its cause, and and he also makes a distinction, even Sina, between God and everything else. So God is necessary by Himself. God does not have a cause; has always existed, will always exist, and everything that exists that we see around us is necessary through a cause. Um, 
and everything that exists except God exists and is necessary through its cause, whereas God is necessary by himself. Um, and uh, in his emanation uh, uh, theory, even Sina uh, thinks of, of um, everything as coming to be from God and, and, and uh, coming, coming to be from God in a necessary way. Um, God determines the, uni, un, the order of the world, so the universal order in the best possible way. Uh, and there's a hierarchy of, of, of causes. So some things are more important than others and uh, uh, the celestial world is very important. Um, and so when it comes to his metaphysics um, and, and his worldview, it seems that um, um, for even senior things are necessary. Everything that happens, happens in the way, in a necessary way. It could not have been otherwise. Um, and Ibn Sina also has some texts on uh, uh, specifically, so he's influenced by Al-Farabi, by um, Aristotle, but also he actually has some texts on, on Qadr, on, on predestination. And he says that uh, this is, uh, so God's predetermination of events or predestination. And as I mentioned, this is a theme from the Quran and Hadith. Usually you find the phrase uh, Al-Qadr or Al-Qadr, and Qadr is... The, is a more general concept, God's first decree, and uh, Qadar means uh, determination of particular events. And, um, and so according to Ibn Sina, um, um, he believes in, 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 in Qadar, which is also you know, an important aspect of Islamic creed. Um, and, uh, and according to Ibn Sina, everything is determined by God, and he doesn't have a, a problem with saying this explicitly um, uh, when, when he discusses uh, Qadar. Um, and he also, um, there's another important, um, um, he wrote on Aristotle um, and uh, in his Shifa, uh, Shifa and in other works. And uh, uh, Aristotle, when we talk about the possible and the necessary, do things happen without a cause? Do they happen um, haphazardly? Um, uh, Arsal discusses this specifically uh, at the end of book two of his uh, physics. Um, and he says, what's um, chance? And uh, this is Itifaq, um, Bart uh, in, in Arabic, um, uh, and Tuhe uh, in, in Greek, uh, he says, uh, be, because people say, oh, this happened by chance. Um, this happened haphazardly. What, what does this mean? And Arsal asks, is this a real cause? And uh, we know that he uh, describes um, uh, causes as being, uh, the causes as being false, so the formal, the material cause, the final uh, cause, and the, and the agent cause. Um, and so he has a complex theory about causality, but he, but Aristotle says, is this kind of fifth cause? Is this um, is this chance a cause? And according to and obviously there are commentaries on this by several philosophers in the Middle Ages, and um, and Avicenna also discuss, even Sina discusses this issue. Um, uh, he says that uh, chance is uh, an accident uh, attached to an essential. Cause so this seems a little bit abstract, but he gives an example. Um, if someone goes to the marketplace to do business there and finds someone who owes him money, so finding one's debtor, uh, uh, then this happened by chance. So let's say that the person who goes to the marketplace um, intending to do business, uh, so the, the the real goal of the action is to do business. But since this person finds someone who holds him money, then, oh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll be cast for my money back now. Uh, and so that would be chance because this was not the intention. But if the person uh, going to the marketplace uh, knows that uh, he's going to find his debtor there, then that wouldn't be by chance. So uh, 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 an event that happens by chance, of what we even seen, it, it's just something that we didn't expect. But obviously, everything has a cause. Everyone who's at the marketplace is there for a particular reason. And so um, um, this doesn't happen 
uh, I mean, we say it's by chance. It means that this person didn't know that uh, this other person was going to be there. And so uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, Imsina doesn't really discuss ethics. So he doesn't say, so he defends um, this idea of, of determinism that everything that happens, happens necessarily. Um, and, he, and he doesn't try to solve the issue of, you know, how, how can we then be made responsible for what we do? So it's not really, he hasn't written much on ethical issues. So, um, but, but that is also a hallmark of um, uh, uh, philosophers who embrace determinism. So we see from his metaphysics that the impossible necessary, the way he understands the concept of chance in Aristotle and his views on, on, on Qadar that he is, I think, um, he leans towards um, determinism. And then now I'll move on to uh, Ibn Rushd and, uh, and whereas uh, Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina were li living to the east of the Islamic empire. Uh, Ibn Rush was in uh, Al-Andalus and in the Maghreb in the 12th century, and uh, he, he became very well known in Europe, Ibn Sin as well, in Al-Farabi, but Ibn Rush was known for his um, commentaries on, on Aristotle, and he wrote detailed commentaries, for instance, um, his uh, long commentary on Aristotle's uh, metaphysics in the uh, modern edition is runs to almost uh, 2,000 pages, so that's a very detailed uh, commentary, and he has long commentaries also on on Aristotle's physics, um, so metaphysics, um, physics, uh, posterior analytics, the anima, and uh, the chilo on, on on the heavens. So he has these five uh, long commentaries, uh, um, and he also wrote on a fiqh, tourist, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, medicine, um, uh, theology, and the connection between theology. Um, in philosophy or religion and uh, philosophy. So, um, and obviously in between we have um, uh, Al-Hazali, I'll mention him briefly. Um, and so like uh, Ibn Sina Al-Farabi, Ibn Rush says that um, God is the true agent, but other things also have power, certain kinds of powers. And um, we have secondary causes. So God is the main cause, but there are other kinds of of causes uh, in nature, like, for instance, uh, fire has the power to burn certain substances, uh, and human beings also uh, um, are causes of various events. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, Ibn Rush had in mind uh, the criticism by Al-Ghazali, he was a very famous um, medieval theologian, and Al-Ghazali had criticized um, Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, uh, because for Al-Ghazali, uh, only God is true agent. He's in al is influenced by Al-Ashari. Um, and so the link between, for instance, natural causes is not necessary. So fire doesn't necessarily burn cotton or wood. Um, and he says, in fact, uh, at least in uh, some of his works, like the Tahafut uh, uh, al-Falasifah, the incoherence of the um, philosophers, he says that it, it's God who burns the cotton, or it's possible for the cotton to burn without fire being there. So, um, uh, Indrush is different from, uh, and so uh, he's trying to address this issue, the uh, criticism of the philosophers made by um, Al Ghazali. Um, and in Rush, um, uh, for one thing, he rejects this idea of emanation that from God only one intellect comes to be, he says, God can cause directly many, many, many things. Um, he draws, draws things from potentiality to actuality. Um, and then uh, he also says, when it comes to the question of what is, uh, you know, possibility and necessity, um, things around us are possible. They can may exist or not exist. Um, and, uh, and so perhaps he has a kind of determinist, but it, it's not the kind of determinism that we find in Ibn Sina, and it's not as obvious. Um, he says that God, God brings uh, things into existence through his command. And um, uh, in, 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 he has one work specifically devoted to uh, theology, the uh, Kesh, Keshvan Manahij, um, 
العديله في عقائد الملا so uh, unveiling the methods um, of the proofs concerning the uh, the principles of faith and in this is why he discusses his it has a detailed discussion on 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 qadar because he says uh, there have been debates within the islamic uh, um, uh, Isla within islamic theology concerning this issue so qadar means god's determination of events and he analyzes in, uh, in, in uh, tackling this issue analyzes the quran and the hadith what do they say about al qadar wal qadar um and also um uh, islamic theology in particular the asharite position and the Tazalite position and the Jabarite position. Um, and he thinks of, there are two extremes. So the, the Mutazilites, the Mutazila, defend the notion of freedom because God is just, he can only punish those who have the ability to act. Um, so he says the Mutazilites defend the principle of, of uh, human freedom. And he says the Jabarites, that comes from Jabar, compulsion in Arabic. Um, they defend the notion of uh, predetermination or predestination of, of human actions. And uh, the Chabrites defended that whatever happens, it's God doing it. If I move my hand, it's God doing it. And I, I don't have the power to do that. Because uh, for the Chabrites, um, um, if I do something and it's within my power, then uh, it, it detracts, takes away from God's power. Um, and so he says, he, he, he's looking for a middle term. So on the one hand, preserve human freedom and God's justice and omnipotence. He says, God is the only uh, creator um, uh, that when we act, human action, uh, like moving or the way we treat others, there are, uh, we have uh, power, but, but we're also conditioned by external factors. Um, and he says that free will uh, or will ikhtiar is the ability to choose between two opposites. Um, and he says how um, he, he describes the process of uh, human action, the way in which we act. He says we imagine and uh, assent to something. Um, uh, for instance, perhaps I feel uh, thirsty and, and um, uh, I decide to drink a glass of water, and, 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 and so I make up my mind and I drink a glass of water. Um, but he also says that if something agreeable uh, is presented to us, let's say if I'm thirsty and there's a glass of water in front of me, I necessarily desire it, so I, I want to drink the water. Um, and so what he says is that the will, human will and free will is determined or conditioned by external uh, factors. So on the one, um, we have the power to pick up the glass of water and drink it, um, but this depends on also external uh, factors. Uh, and he also says that uh, God determines the things that condition our actions. Um, and so when we read this uh, chapter of this work on theology, on uh, Ilm al-Kalam, uh, where he tries to solve various controversies within uh, Ilm al-Kalam. Uh, he says there is um, free will, but um, human action and the way you act is not completely aut autonomous. So it's it's conditioned by 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 God's decisions and and external factors. Um, and so our choice is conditioned by um, external factors. And so there is. Um, this notion of secondary causality or causation, uh, which means that certain things have certain powers and we also have the power to move and do many other things. Um, uh, but ultimately, everything goes back to God. So he wants to defend the notion of free will, but at the same time, um, um, uh, there's this, it's, it's, it's not very clear that we're autonomous, that we, we, we the decisions Come entirely from from ourselves, which which was you know later Kant would say that's the hallmark of of, of free will that we give ourselves the law. That's what autonomy means. Um, and so um, his position is perhaps somewhere in between Ibn Sina and, and Al Farabi. 
Um, and so as we have seen, uh, uh, Al-Farabi is of these three philosophers is the one who's more in favor of, of freedom, free will, uh, even Sinai, I think, is a, a determinist, and, uh, and Ibn Rush seeks a kind of, of middle ground, but perhaps leans towards um, determinism. And I, th I think these questions are still very important in, in with regard to, to um, if we think, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, the question, questions uh, relate to um, theology, whether God determines what we do or not. And also, we could think of it also in terms of um, nature, are we determined by everything around us, perhaps by our genes, in the sense that we don't have complete uh, autonomy. And, and obviously, this is a, a question within um, ethics, but also uh, pertaining to you know their scientific issues, um, uh, also that are that are related to this to this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for a stimulating uh, lecture, actually. And um, I realized that the, the problems and the questions of uh, philosophy are much, much longer lived than the problems and questions of um, natural sciences, like uh, consider physics or astronomy. Uh, the, we are talking about uh, how what people were busy with a thousand years ago, more than a thousand years ago, actually, and the problems of physics or physics or astronomy they had at that time that they were thinking of at that time do not uh, exist any longer. I mean, they are all solved. They moved on to other problems, but uh, philosophy problems from a thousand years ago and even. 2,000 years ago are still with us and still valid. They are still alive. Uh, it, it's apparently so. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's one question I'd like to start with, which is uh, from, uh, um, from my colleague, uh, the professor who just uh, left the screen. <laughs> He's asking, how is the determinism problem in Christian thought? since you studied that too. It, it's very similar. Um, there's also the question of uh, God's knowledge and the fact that uh, God's knowledge of the future could possibly mean that the future is determined, in, in which case then we wouldn't really have uh, free will because if things are determined in, in advance, then the outcome can only be one. Um, and so that's one of the... Um, uh, one of the issues, and uh, and also um, uh, so it's that that's a similar question, and the, and then there's also in Christianity as well, God is uh, all knowing and all powerful, and uh, and so how do we um, reconcile that with uh, human free will, and uh, and so the, the way the question is phrased is 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 very similar. Uh, 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 philosophers in the scholastic tradition, like St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, will say that he accepts, for instance, secondary causality. He says that human beings um, and other, even natural beings have power to do things, but ultimately God determines what, what happens. But um, uh, he can determine things in a sort of contingent way. It, that, that's, that's how he tries to reconcile uh, the issue, but it's very similar. So it's it's it, it, it the same problems are uh, being discussed in 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 the Middle Ages and even before late antiquity. Uh, so it's 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 I think it's very similar, it, it, except that uh, Aquinas and the other philosophers they think it's it's all right to accept secondary causality to say that we have some power, but that power is ultimately determined comes from God ultimately. It also exists in. Um non asharit uh, philosophy in in the east too and no wonder uh, i mean no wonder they are similar because uh, uh, islam got it from the greeks and uh, that europe got it from islam and so it's uh, it's all give and take and it's uh, sort of the same highway that uh, everybody is traveling on okay in Absolutely. your speech yeah you said unicorns are possible but not actualized 
this reminds me of uh, this is not a question actually, just a comment. This uh, reminds me of uh, Karl Popper's Black Swans. You know, he, he told that uh, at that time that they were possible but were not realized. Uh, and then somebody brought some black swans to Ankara. Uh, to to one of our parks, so they they do exist. It turns out maybe they were uh, manufactured, sort of uh, uh, genetically uh, altered to 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 be black. I, I have no idea, but they are swans, all right, and they are very happy there. Okay, and uh, what I understand is the coincidence, or um, in Turkish too, it's tesaduf. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the same word uh, used in Arabic. Uh, what I understand is uh, these philosophers think that uh, uh, one process uh, proceeds with uh, perfect determinism and a second one does the same too. But when they collide, when they tesaduf, uh, then it's a surprise for both of them. It's a coincidence for both of them. But uh, if you step back and uh, consider the initial conditions, I'm talking like a physicist now, initial conditions of both of them, then uh, the whole thing, including the uh, tesadif, including the collision, are, is also deterministic. Okay. Yeah. So the, the whole picture, <laughs> so, to, so to speak, is... Um, I'm a quantum chemist myself, and... Uh, it's similar to, uh, to modern quantum chemistry. Um, I think it was Max Planck who said there is a crack in the wall of determinism uh, by a width of the Planck constant. Well, uh, it, this is true, but not true. If you insist uh, to know the positions and the velocities of all particles, the initial uh, velocities and positions, uh, then determinism will tell you how they will end up at any time. I mean, you can predict uh, solar eclipses or whatever. <laughs> but it turns out in quantum mechanics, you cannot know both at the same time. So this looks like a crack in the wall of determinism. However, it's not... Uh, if you look at the big picture, if you don't insist on knowing the initial velocities and uh, um, positions, if you take, pick other variables that are compatible with each other, then things become perfectly predictable again. I mean, if you if you grab the wave function, so to speak, uh, the the evolution of the wave function is deterministic, except we don't. Uh, see and think in terms of wave functions. We see and think in terms of position and so on. Oh. <sighs> well, my question is, um, I understand um, Ibn Rushd's uh, Averroes' books were burned by um, Ghazali's people, the Asharite Ashari, people. And when I said that, uh, people replied that, uh, fine, but uh, Ghazali's books were also burned. <laughs> so is it, uh, I mean, is it a pastime of uh, Andalus to, to burn each other's books? But I guess, I guess it depended on um, who was in power and which uh, oh. theologians they were in favor at the time. But, but going back to the, the question of clashes, I think it's very interesting how even Sina um, mentions this, because it really comes from the atomists, uh, Democritus and mm -hmm. Epicurus, uh, uh, how, how two uh, causal chains or, or two things can, can, can collide. Uh, but, but for Epicurus and Democritus, this, meant, this happened randomly. And even Sina says, no, this, even this is determined, as you mentioned. Uh, so um, um, I think it's interesting how, uh, how he adapts and uses the theory of clashes to uh, prove uh, uh, determinism. And, uh, and yes, I think it's very interesting uh, current debates as well, because I, I think Einstein had an issue with this. 
um, uh, this this famous... to, which was present in, 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 in quantum mechanics. So I think the debate in physics is still is yeah, still yeah. alive. And, uh, yeah, with regard to book burning, yes, it, it's interesting because um, uh, Al Ghazali criticized um, the philosophers in his uh, uh, Tahfut al uh, but then some other theologians who even studied with him and knew him, and, and even from Al Andalus, they they thought that he was too philosophical, that there was too much philosophy in his um, uh, theology. So um, Ghazalis or uh, Ibn Rushd. Uh, uh, I think even with Al Ghazali, some uh, later, uh, uh, I mean, or some contemporary thought of his work as too, he, he had somehow been corrupted when he studied the philosophers. And even although he criticized them, then then uh, he was kind of corrupted by philosophical thinking. Although although Ibn Rush, then yes, he he tries to um, uh, make place for. Uh, uh, the study of philosophy in Al Andalus after Ghazali. Ghazali was corrupted. He says he was corrupted by uh, the people in power, more or less. I mean, well, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing that uh, present uh, people in power are not uh, really interested in philosophy, <laughs> or maybe, maybe they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, actually, uh, if you kill determinism, then science will go, will die with it. I mean, if you if you don't have determinism, then you have no reason of studying uh, um, the laws of nature, because um, I mean, the laws you find uh, might be different this second uh, from the laws uh, or the next second. Uh, so. No determinism, no science. I mean, I understand um, uh, in Asharit, uh, Ashariye, as we say, um, God creates uh, the universe every split second. And uh, it's completely his whim how the next split second will be created. So there is no determinism and there is there is no reason to study physics or chemistry or whatnot. But then they will say, no, this is not true. Uh, we are trying to find the sunnah of God, the habit of God. Well, okay. <laughs> as long as uh, people try to find uh, natural laws, so it's, it's fine with me, I suppose. Uh, you must be familiar with uh, Robert Riley's book. I don't know uh, how well he is known uh, in philosophical circles, but uh, this book, Closing of the Muslim Mind, uh, I've uh, which, heard of it. Pardon me? He, he highly thought of? I, I've heard of it, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a famous title. Yeah, yeah, it's translated into Turkish too. Uh -huh. uh, so, so uh, I mean, the, 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 he says what I just uh, rephrased. Um, since the universe is recreated every split second, then, then we are powerless. I, and it's if it's completely uh, without any deterministic linkage between the split seconds, okay. A theologist uh, friend of mine called Asharia philosophy of slavery. He said yes. because um, at the time uh, Asharia became predominant, uh, it was also used. Uh, to quell any uh, opposition to the ruler. No. Uh -huh. So, um, this sort of uh, ends all my uh, questions, actually. Uh, if you have any comments, uh, final comments to make, uh, I mean, we would be pleased yeah. to hear. Yes. So, I, I think this question of, yeah, maybe really we're talking about two kinds of determinism. So, whether God determines things directly according to his will. We call that occasionalism. Uh, and that mm -hmm. would be maybe al Hazalis or the uh, the way of the Asharia. Um, that would be one kind of determinism. But in that case, it would be very difficult for us to know what God wants uh, at mm -hmm. each moment and yeah. predict what's going to happen. And then we have uh, philosophers like uh, Al-Farabi, uh, Ibn Sina and Ibn Rush, they've been influenced by 
uh, Aristotle and in, in Greek philosophy. And then they say, no, uh, God created the, the laws of nature, even though the laws of nature, this is a later concept in modern philosophy. But I, I think we can talk about certain laws of nature in in um, uh uh, Aristotelian philosophy, and and um, and so we can we can predict an eclipse, and we, we can know how uh, mm -hmm. you know certain events are going to uh, naturally um, processes are going to uh, unfold. So th this is a different kind of determinism, and it allows us to predict events, uh, and it allows us to understand nature, and uh, it's also very important to highlight the fact that for Aristotle, cause, which was idea, means, so it's cause, but it's also an explanation. So if we know the cause, we, we know how things um, happen. Mm -hmm. So maybe these are two kinds of, different kinds of, of determinism. And then uh, we could think of, uh, and so we can think of determinism, or uh, if we think of contemporary physics and quantum mechanics, perhaps, uh, do we have determinism or not? And we can think, we could also think of, the natural world is being determined by uh, by the laws of nature, but but still think of an ethical domain which is independent of of natural processes. And then we we this is would be the compatibilist position. So we would have determinism in nature, but there would still be free will uh, for human beings. That that's one of the questions. And in then when it comes to Hazali, he's very complex because. Um, uh, he uh, uh, was clearly close to the uh, to the Asharia. Uh, at the same time, he embraced Sufism at a certain point in his life, um, and he also studied the philosophers. Uh, and so, his work is very complex, and his views are very complex. And uh, there's a debate among scholars whether whether he completely rejected secondary causality. So maybe he does accept, but in certain cases, but he doesn't think it's it's always a necessary law although you know for scientists this would still be a problem there has to be a necessary connection between mm -hmm. cause and effect and in Ghazali saying well there's a connection perhaps it's not uh, necessary and in different works he has different positions like this is still being debated by by scholars so he's complex he's a very complex um, thinker mm -hmm. uh, so um, I think we can I mean we yeah I think it'd be difficult to blame Ghazali for any decline in um, there would also yeah. political, uh, you know, historical, cultural changes that happened, and and, and so to blame, uh, uh, you know, Al Ghazali for uh, any uh, decline in in you know the, the the pursuit of science, or I think that would be uh, perhaps uh, an overreaction. And and with regard to the political issue, that that's an interesting question as well, because going back to early. Um, uh, Islamic theology, the the uh, the Qadariya, the Qadarites, emphasized. Uh, in this case, they emphasized the human free will and accountability. And, and and yes, they would say that the caliph is also responsible and accountable for his actions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the the, the political question is also um, very important. And and, mm -hmm. and and yes, so there's, there's this connection between emphasizing human free will and in the uh, human accountability for everyone, including the caliph. Hmm. Well, um, the questions are still open, as I said in the beginning. <laughs> uh, yes. And, and even so. in, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, how, thing, how um, uh, science has changed. And um, I, I think that's right. Obviously, there was a, a huge development then in, in, in the modern period with, with Copernicus and Galileo. Uh, but I, I tend to think of, um, obviously, it's, I think it's very, I'm not a scientist. I think it's very important to study the, the history of science. And um, it seems to me, at least, for instance, even Roche says that Aristotle founded the discipline of, of metaphysics, physics, and, and logic. And, um, and I think, uh, let's say within physics, that some of the questions are the same. Obviously, we have very different, scientists have very different answers, and it's much more complex. But, you know, physics is still about uh, uh, space and time and, 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 and change and, uh, um, and, and cause, how do we explain natural phenomena? So some of the things, some of the basics, just the topics that are being debated, I think that there's still some there's some continuity, even though obviously uh, Arsal didn't know about gravity and all that. So um, 
but I, I like to see the, the continuity and, and how some of the questions are, and, and even with, with, with quantum mechanics, the question of, um, you know, if things change gradually or if, or if there's a leap, this is something that preoccupied also medieval and ancient philosophers. <laughs> But, but things like we, we are not um, uh, questioning whether uh, Earth is sitting in a bowl of water uh, anymore. You know, we know it's not sitting in a bowl of water with only one hemisphere popping out of the water. Uh, in fact, it seems that uh, Christopher Columbus uh, tried to prove that it wasn't uh, really sitting in a bowl of water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the others did too. We, we don't discuss that anymore. Uh, another thing uh, that strikes me, uh, let this be uh, my last question actually, is you know, how Ghazali starts uh, searching for an un, um, a certain knowledge. Mm -hmm. he, he, he wants to know something uh, with no possibility of error okay, yes this is and no possibility of error and this is exactly the opposite of what popper tells us that science uh, uh, actually develops with uh, mistakes with, with, with falsities so uh, if you stick to ghazali you can never have popper's uh, science they are good, opposite to each other. But uh, he's also supposed to have uh, dragged uh, Sufism into, into the Sharia, uh, yes. into the, 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 inside the limits of a Sharia, sort of. <laughs> okay. If I listen to you a little bit more, I will uh, start... Um, um, you know, talking about philosophy a lot, I suppose. Uh, that's <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe I'll just say something about, um, um, yeah, uh, uh, Rosalie, um, um, yes, he's initially, this is in the uh, uh, Deliver from Era, Mokhed uh, yeah. and he, uh, um, where he's trying to find I mean, Minat Dalal, I think, is the name Minat of the... Dalal. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and yes, there's this kind of skeptical uh, position in each, and so he says, so I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to see within mm -hmm. the Islamic sciences and, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. those who have uh, developed themselves in the truth. So he analyzes, you know, the Sufi path, the, the theologians and the philosophers and um, also, the Ismailis, and, uh, and and then he finds that the Sufi path is the the best one. But I think it, uh, late age tries to find, so he he doesn't keep this uh, uh, maintain this skeptical position. That's right. So um, yeah, it, it it it's a problem for him. If uh, but at the same time, uh, then saying the uh, the Hafthal philosopher he thinks it's not possible to know about God through you know th that the intellect cannot. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's one of the. You know, but that's another huge question. I mean, that's how uh, main, um, uh, I mean, schools of uh, Islam are classified. Um, will we be able to see God? <laughs> so, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, the question of the afterlife. Yes. Mm -hmm, yeah. Well, thanks a lot again. Uh, this is this was a thing, and we hope to see you here uh, some sometime. Inshallah. In yeah, inshallah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.